Good evening and welcome everyone to this month's virtual film club. My name is Alicia Dixon and I'm the development associate with film at Lincoln Center. And I'm so glad all of you decided to join us tonight to discuss Kelly Reichardt's film, First Cow, an A24 release. Uh, before we get started, I'd just like to call out a few organizational updates. Uh, as many of us know, Congressman and civil rights leader John Lewis passed away over the weekend. So to honor his legacy, I highly recommend you all stream John Lewis Good Trouble, now available in our virtual cinema. Uh, as members of Film at Lincoln Center, you do receive a discount on the film, and more information can be found in the member corner on our website. Uh, and please keep an eye out on your email. Uh, in the coming weeks, we'll be announcing important information about the New York Film Festival, which is happening this September. Uh, tonight would not be possible if not for the commitment of our members, so thank you all so much for your continued support. Uh, if you're not a Film at Lincoln Center member and are watching on YouTube, uh, Film at Lincoln Center is a nonprofit organization that has been New York's home for cinema since 1969. Uh, we hope you'll consider joining today and you can learn more at filmlink.org. Now, without further ado, I'm going to turn things over to our programmers, Maddie Whittle and Tyler Wilson. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Alicia. Thanks, Alicia. Hi, everyone. Hi, Tyler. Hi, Maddie. Hi everyone. Uh, thanks again for joining our uh, what what are now becoming monthly film club discussions. Yeah, thanks for tuning in. Um, we, as you probably know, if you uh, received the link to register to this event, we're talking about First Cow, as Alicia mentioned, um, which uh, already it feels like we have a bit of an institutional history with, even though it's a brand new movie. Uh, we screened it in NYFF last fall, and now we're releasing it in our virtual cinema. Yeah, and I guess, um, well, I guess it was, in, it was in theaters for a little bit in March, right? Mm -hmm. Am I crazy? Did you see it in theaters then? I did, yeah. I, yeah. I, uh, that was actually the last time I saw it. I saw it once back uh, last year when we showed it in the festival, and then um, I saw, actually attended a press screening in March right before everything shut down, um, and uh, that, is it? I actually haven't watched it on a small screen. Um, so wow, um, that's, yeah, you're in a rare position. Uh, yeah. when we got to see it in a the theater. I, I saw it also during the in the New York Film Festival with you, Maddie, and uh, yeah, I, I caught it again on the small screen. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's a shame that it, it, it's uh, theatrical run was cut short because it's such a beautiful film to look at and, and also uh, to listen to. Um, so hopefully, there's like a chance down the down the road for a proper um, run in theaters. Um, but yeah, I don't know, where should we start with uh, First Cow? Oh, there's lots of ways we could start. Um, I guess before we get into it, if you haven't attended one of these before, um, as our guests, you can chime in at any point. There's a little Q&A icon down at the bottom. Where you can type in a question, um, which we'll be able to see and then read out loud. Or I believe there's a way you can raise your hand uh, and then we call on you um yeah. which i've never tried myself but um if if uh that's another option if you'd like to speak out loud um so at any point i think this is going to be kind of an open conversation and we're happy to have people chime in at any point whether by text or uh by voice yeah let's try to keep this casual and not have it as a sort of uh dialogue followed by a Q&A. We'll try to bring questions in uh, here and there throughout. Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah. Um. So yeah, where to begin with First Cow? Um, it's, you know, we were, we were lucky uh, a couple weeks ago now we had um, a free talk with Kelly Reichardt to talk about the film moderated by Dennis Lim, um, which was really a joy. It was um sort of a sprawling conversation and I, I think hearing her talk about this film in the process of developing it with her co-writer who's also the novelist of the book that it was based on um is just kind of I, I find it disarming every time I hear her talk because she's sort of her films sometimes can feel kind of grand in the sort of um, substance of what they're saying and, and yet at the same time 
so understated and so sort of tonally um, just maybe quiet's not the right word, but um, there's sort of this this interesting tension between the idea that she's saying big things in sort of modest means um, and somehow hearing her talk bridges that for me. Yeah, I mean, I, I I think there's like yeah, there's a lot to pull from her other films when watching this one. I mean, it, it I'm, I'm sure it reminds people of uh, Meek's cut off, Old Joy, sort of thinking about this uh, male friendship again. Though this one's sort of about the beginning of a friendship, and Old Joy's more about it's sort of sort of a sad conclusion to a friendship. But I, I, yeah, I mean, her her films sort of always uh, deal with these sort of. Uh, transitory figures or these kind of isolated figures who are kind of faced with outside forces meddling with uh something or other that they would like to do and like it's uh, she's always bringing in nature and like uh I, I don't know i think the way she frames nature particularly is really beautiful and subtle and uh i think what stands out in this film and also a lot of her other films for me is just the economy of her shooting style that I think like uh, this film in particular is it's very uh, the camera is literally static from from most of the time I think like the only moment that at least stood out for me is uh, where there's an actual sort of uh, uh, cinematography flourish or what have you is during the uh, like the tea scene mm -hmm. which I, that 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 scene uh, beyond that really just stands out for me for a number of reasons um but uh yeah i mean it, it she's sort of usually dealing with like simple pans people walking in and out of the frame that uh has already been set up and uh yeah um that's why yeah i don't know if, if we want to like actually like talk about that that tea scene i i, I do love it so much uh um where you have that 360 degree sort of pan that sort of introduces you not only to the like the interior space of uh, who is there and uh, who's involved in this discussion but also uh, a way to introduce Cookie and uh, King Lou into that uh, disastrous uh, system. Yeah and in some ways that feels pivotal to the entire film this idea of sort of um, you know telling the story set amid this pioneer community, which is sort of um, just a setting of man against the elements, the idea of, of early years, earlier Americans um, sort of charting a path through the wilderness to build America and build a capitalist system where one didn't exist before. And in that scene, it actually, in some ways that scene reminds me of, of certain John Ford movies and uh, because it sets up this tension between the outside nature, sort of untamed, uncivilized, um, the beauty of the natural world, but also the danger of it. And then this interior that is regimented and civilized and um, sort of hemmed in by Western culture and traditions and econ economics. And it's, um, in some ways, that feels like the most dramatic scene in the movie and the most sort of action packed, even though relatively little happens in it and um, it's it's not an eventful scene but the stakes feel very high both sort of psychologically and spiritually and also um, in the fate of these characters. Yeah I think that there's like a lot going on and like uh, it's it's one of the moments not the only moment I think you kind of get a, an idea of this in the in the bar scene early on but like just uh, how this film is sort of pointing out that uh, the story of the West is is kind of a transnational encounter, and uh, the tea scene in particular sort of shows like the global sprawl of frontier living, at least in this point of time, uh, in the early eighteen hundreds. It's like, and like it, you have the English chief factor, you have uh, the American captain, you have the um, the, like the Chinook chief and his family and one of whom I think is presumably married to uh, the chief actor Toby Jones's character um, I think Lily Gladstone because she's also 
sort of put in the uncomfortable position of being the translator for him that is also very uh, selective in her translation. Like she doesn't at all, I think, translate for the, uh, the older gentleman, uh, that sort of conversation about uh, punishing someone for mutiny and like making it, uh, some like making an example out of someone but um yeah i mean it you kind of like as uh like watching that scene for me like when you when i see like cookie and uh king lou enter like you can kind of already see uh this the like the, the myth of manifest destiny like already deflating uh right before their eyes like uh, the wealthy are already they, they've they been wealthy and they're already putting their stakes in the land and have already set up their own kind of customs and you have those around them who are sort of just uh either adapting to their uh their style of living or just sort of scrounging for what's left and um yeah and not to even get into the, the like the ideas that are brought up about sort of nature being destroyed around them yeah and it's a scene that is really about power and old power and new power and and um it's i think something probably someone more articulate than me could could connect that with your observations about the the sort of formal characteristics of the scene but i think it's um you know we've seen up to this point in the film we've seen how uh cookie has been obtaining the milk that legalistically belongs to the chief factor, but that uh, he's found a way to um, sort of, I mean, steal essentially in the middle of the night and use uh, for, to produce these cakes that are um, a huge hit and beloved and be there's a very high demand for as soon as they're in introduced. Uh, and th But this is the first time that you see uh, Cooking King Lou come face to face with capital, with the the powerful, wealthy uh, man from back east who uh, owns the cow, who has rights over the cow in in legal terms, and it's um, it sets up this drama that isn't totally resolved within the scene, but sort of in some ways branches out and and brings into it the drama of the chief factor's wife, as you mentioned, played by Lily Gladstone, and and her father, I believe, who's presumably a, a powerful uh, member of his community, and but is sort of treated as uh, a, a, if not subservient, then kind of secondary person in this frame of 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 uh, sort of European Western power, um, and it. it you see how it all sort of, how capital swallows everything up. And then ultimately that's sort of the, what Cookie and King Lou are up against in there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, go, going off what you said at the start about like how uh, this scene is a moment of showing, uh, or showing power, um, even just formally the way uh, Kelly Reichardt films that scene is so different than the way we've encountered other spaces within the film. Like, obviously much of it is filmed within nature, but there are so many interior spaces as well that that we're sort of uh, looking inside of, or, but also, I mean, you have uh, King Lou's shed, um, you have the bar, but only in this scene, um, the chief factor's house is the camera actually able to do a 360 and sort of understand the actual uh the space of the house because it's actually much bigger and it's more opulent than than the others it's a, it's a it's a house that actually has windows and not just holes in the walls um and yeah yeah it's sort of sealed off from the elements um which also gives it sort of the stature of its own sort of world like it this is by by being sealed off this this interior is uh, a separate world unto itself or wants to be maybe yeah i mean uh, i mean we haven't really even talked about 
uh, how delicious the food actually looks. I'm, I'm was shocked by how hungry this film makes me. I know. It's, uh, historically accurate recipes that, uh, yeah, I don't know, still look uh, delicious in 2020. And I mean, I think like actually like the food itself is also another way of uh, depicting power in, in just the way these characters relate to food. Um, just the oily cakes versus the clafu tea. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And yeah, and just the way we see characters interacting with food, like uh, it, it, it means different things to different characters. Like for Cookie, it's like, well, it's his job for one when he's with the, the, the trappers at the start, but it's clearly like a, an artistic reprieve for him. Yeah, and expression. Yeah. And like for King Lou, it's like, um, more so a means to an end, a way to make money. And then you have like the characters in the, in the chief factor's house, or, or I guess the chief factor in, in that, and that captain who uh, treat food far more, I think, superficially. Yeah. And, um, like as status symbols and commodities. And... Yeah, it's like something separate uh, from survival for them. It, like, I mean, he, hires Cookie to make that clafu tea just purely to like humili literally humiliate uh as he says in the film uh that that captain I don't even know if he's a captain actually I keep saying captain whatever his position uh, is the yeah. military visiting yeah. <laughs> to be impressed yeah 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 or it's like a, it's uh food is like a, this object of nostalgia mm -hmm for Culture. the chief factor, which in itself is this wealthy privilege to like look fondly back on the thing that you left behind. Whereas most people in that space are going to the West to flee their previous situation. Yes. Like, find a better life where this, like the Toby Jones character seems so like, like miserable. Yeah, and it's the height of luxury for him to recreate what he knows in this wilderness. Whereas, uh, like, as you said, for most of the people, you know, seeking wealth and fortune and a new start in the West, you know, traditionally in depictions of the American West, that's sort of meant to represent a departure from law and order and civilization and Western culture. And it's um, that you could sort of, he, he identifies, you know, when he tries an oily cake, he identifies something that reminds him of home while being new and different and sort of impossible to put his finger on. And what he takes away from that is that I can hire this man to make me a clafu tea that will remind me of home and impress this high and mighty guest who I'm, you know, who's visiting. And um, it's, in some ways, it's sort of different. I, I don't this is a this is a different conversation maybe but the the sort of way that this film views entrepreneurship as a part of capitalism that's not necessarily uh the problem with the system but rather maybe one of the system's redeeming qualities um is I think comes through in that way that cookie is kind of manipulated or kind of seen as a tool to be used to you know produce this clafu tea that that um is serving this purpose yeah there's like yeah there's the like quote um from king lou he said like I, I forget at one point when he's just like when trying to figure out a way to find some sort of successful business he's like you either need capital or a crime and yeah, it, uh, I mean, I, I'm not sure this quite connects to what you're saying, but like, uh, I think it just goes to show their, their circumstances and that, and uh, how they see their, their situation in the West and like how uh, they don't see it purely in moral terms, but rather in, in like just out of survival and necessity and that uh, the problem in their situation with this film is not that they steal the milk, it's just that they, they got caught. Yeah. 
I'd be interested. Have you seen Meek's cutoff recently? Because I haven't seen it since it was new, and I wish that I had a stronger memory of of that film because I feel like these those two films are kind of in dialogue. I haven't seen it too recently, but um, yeah, I'm. I mean, aside from the like the obvious connections of, I mean, it's a it's a it's an older western, I think, right? It's not. It's like in the eighteen forties. Right. It's about getting there as opposed to being there. And it, it's obvious. It's also interesting because it's uh, it certainly features more like like woman characters mm -hmm. of the frontier, whereas this film is. Uh, makes them noticeably uh, rare. Uh, and that sort of is interesting in itself and the way you see sort of um, the division of labor play out in First Cow and, and how traditional roles are just split across anyone who is actually there. Like the, the I guess the, the most obvious example is when a Cookie goes to King Lou's house and like just immediately starts uh, doing his part while uh, Lou is like chopping wood or something. Um, I think he just starts cleaning and it, there are like, there are no like ascribed roles right now. They just fall into their roles yeah. organically. Um, which again feels contrasted with the sort of regimented hierarchical um, you know, role assignment of the the chief factor's house. Yeah. Um, I see that we've gotten a few comments. Should we dig into these a little bit? Yeah, sure. Um, Mimi Feinstein says, I was interested in how she shoots through windows, doors, even slats, looking out uh, on, into a specific spot to see the world up close and tight. Is this her style in other films as well? That's a good <laughs> question. Um, I am trying to place that technique in other films of hers. I think it, I think we see some of it in certain women um, and maybe a little bit in sort of the framing narrative of Old Joy um, in the sort of portions of that movie that are shot indoors, which is not very much of it. Um, but I do think it, like John Ford, um, who I think is sort of the, uh, this is very true of, he was interested in sort of the relationship between architectural spaces and their qualities versus the expanse of wilderness beyond them. And I think she taps into some of that too. Yeah. Um, I mean, I see, the, I mean, her other films are admittedly are not super, super fresh in my head right now, but like I seem to remember or like her, her older films, not like, um, not like um, certain women or, or Meeks cut off, but but something more like Wendy Wendy and Lucy and uh, Old Joy. Those films felt more handheld to me, um, whereas I feel like she's edged toward more stationary shots. Um, but I feel like she's always interested in the landscape of her. Uh, but just lands, just landscape in, in general, and how her her figures, her her characters interact uh, with them, and I think like you have, I mean, you have the the sort of present day framing of this film with the barge sort of uh, emerging onto the frame, uh, the, like the Columbia River, and um, like I also recall similarly in in like industrial landscape shots in um old joy and wendy and lucy um especially in the be like in the beginning of wendy and lucy i think there's all like a train passing and, and um i think it's um yeah i mean I, I don't know exactly what to extrapolate out of that but yeah it's where i i since you mentioned the first shot or the opening with the barge um i I loved that shot the first time I saw it and the second time I saw it and I, I it might be my favorite shot in the movie. It just, I, I remember just sort of taking my breath away. It's just, it's this boat moving very, very, very slowly across the water and sort of linearly across the screen. And it's, it's a very patient shot. Nothing really happens except the movement of this boat into the frame. Um, and it just, 
there's in some ways I think that shot is sort of um, a manifesto in a way where she's just like asserting her interest in observing time passing and observing change without hurrying it along and without um, trying, you know, there, there's something, there's something that's sort of assertively passive about that shot that I just find really sort of startling and, and interesting. Yeah, I, I, um, it's really effective in, in how it kind of instantly sets um, the, like the, the, the tone of the film. Um, um, yeah, and then, and the pace. I see someone has asked us a question. Um, Harshal Alukar has asked, can you talk about her choice of aspect ratio for this film and Eek's Cutoff? Um, and he suggests that it might have more reasons than just being period pieces, the similarity between the two. And I think um, this is something I would love to do more of a thorough study of her films side by side and see what she does with aspect ratios. Because I think as a general rule of thumb, uh, any filmmaker who plays around with aspect ratios is is doing something with that choice um, and I don't I wouldn't claim to know what it what her intention is but there I mean this this and wait uh, let me look at the question this and um, Meeks cut off her like academy ratio right I, I mean so, yeah. Which I, I, I think it's a bit of a like subversive choice when it comes to the Western, uh, considering that so many of them are known to have these ultra widescreen um, ratios to depict the landscape. And um, that's not to say, I mean, we've already talked about it, that uh, Reichard isn't interested in the actual natural spaces of of these periods, I think she's actually extremely fa like fascinated with them. Um, but um, yeah, I don't. Maybe you could say it's she's more inter interested in an intimate history, like a. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, and this in itself is like sort of getting a, like a certain kind of history of the West that's uh, not told because it's sort of like the history of the losers you know yeah. the less powerful mm -hmm. totally no i think that's a very true i mean that the, the that sort of comparison with the the vistas of sort of the western tradition is totally true it's it's this is a movie that's set within that context but that is you know framing a different kind of story by thanks to its framing it's it's sort of focusing our attention on um the small and the, the um sort of close as opposed to the vista and the expanse yeah and the, i mean uh, yeah i mean just naturally that aspect ratio sort of invites a kind of claustrophobia to certain scenes i mean like you certainly feel the tightness of spaces when you're inside because of that framing and um, you can, of course, maybe like read into that further with uh, characterizations and like their psychology and like how they're actually feeling and interacting with uh, this kind of newly formed like civil society. But um, yeah, I don't know. All of that's purely speculative. Um, there is another question. Uh, from Solil Nathwani, uh, for me, the film very, very much, as you say, about the effects of capitalism on nature, but also very much about borders. Can you talk about that a little bit? Um, so talking about capitalism on nature and borders. I'd also, I'd also love for you to discuss the cow and her use of it. For me, the animal felt very human in this film, and as a result, the scenes where Cookie is stealing milk, and also the scene where they all go to see her felt unsettling. Um, maybe work backwards. So yeah. we haven't talked about the cow yet too much. Yeah, we haven't. Uh, and that actually reminds me of my, I think my favorite comment that Kelly made in the, the talk that she did with Dennis a few weeks ago, uh, where Dennis asked her about casting the cow. And she said it was very superficial. Uh, she she they looked at cows and the cow that they chose was the most beautiful cow with those big soulful eyes. And she is a gorgeous cow. I mean, yeah, she's a pretty cow. What a beauty. And I think that, you know, she is the titular cow like she's the namesake for the film and and there's you know that's worth thinking about about what is it 
about the cow that, I mean, and the, the, the name of the film was changed from the name of the novel in which it was based. The original novel was called The Half-Life, um, which I assume uh, is in reference to the skeleton and carbon dating uh, that would have gone into tracing the, the skeleton mm-hmm. back to the story, but I haven't read the novel, so I can't say that for sure. Um, but instead, the film is called First Cow, and it's, it's about cow. Um, yeah. And, the, or, and so the, the sort of the second part is the scenes where Cookie is stealing milk and also the scene where they all go to see her felt unsettling. I don't, I mean, I think it felt unsettling in the sense that they're like essentially performing a heist in that moment. So it's a bit tense, but um, it, it feels also very sweet with the way like Cookie interacts with the cow. And it's like, again, goes back to like the way these characters interact with their food and like their relationship to nature. And like you see, you see Cookie who actually uh, cares deeply about this this thing that is sort of his art or connected to his art uh, loosely and um, you see it sort of snuggling up against him when they're looking at the cow with the captain and the chief factor and like yeah you sort of get the sense that Cookie is the only one in the film who sees the cow as a living creature and that for everyone else the cow is just a means to an end. The cow is the, the source of the milk that makes the good baked goods, you know, or that allows the chief factor have, to have cream in his tea, you know. And um, for Cookie, the cow is a creature who is, you know, generously giving him her milk and allowing her to, allowing him to approach her. And um, it's sort of, it is, it is unsettling in a way, but I think it's unsettling in a sort of good way. It sort of startles you into this this sort of affectionate feeling of being part of sort of a a, a communing um, between beings. At least that's how I experienced it. Yeah. Um, and so the first part of this question is sort of for us to discuss capitalism, with well, the effects of capitalism on nature and uh, about uh, borders uh, in the film. I mean, Well, immediately when I think about the borders in the film, I think about how initially the cow is sort of just set up uh, or sort of stationed in the field. But of course, by the time uh, the chief factor learns that someone was actually stealing milk from the cow, we then see it trapped in a fence. And yeah, so you kind of get this moment where you sort of see this developing town at a moment where borders are not quite clear, or at least they're only important to the wealthy, where like it's only the chief factor who has guards um, employed on his grounds. And like, uh, he's even like walking around the town telling people to like look alive or something. I think that's in the town, but, or maybe that could be closer to his house, but um, yeah, it, like it, it just seems like property is yet to be a, like of any sort of concept to a lot of these people it, it's more so just there are spaces for them to survive in at mm-hmm. this moment yeah and and sort of looking at that from the flip side when we meet cookie he's sleeping out under the stars in the woods and and you know he's with a, a group that's making their way to the camp and then um i can't recall where he sleeps when he first arrives at the camp or if we see that but eventually he moves in with King Lou and um, sort of joins him in this in creating this home space that is enclosed and it's not as it's not as enclosed as the uh, chief factor's home um, but it is a shelter and you see him sweeping leaves out of the floor of the home and out onto the ground outside and it's like this clear sort of statement of there's an inside and there's an outside and we move the dirt and the leaves from the inside to the outside in order to keep the inside clean and it's sort of a less hostile means of establishing borders because the border is about creating a nurturing space on the inside for the people who live in it as opposed to protecting property and keeping outsiders out Um, and it's so in some ways it's sort of uh, gives us these two different views of of enclosure. Yeah. 
Um, let's see. I see we have uh, another couple of questions in the chat. Um, Peter Vell says, uh, how did the ending hit you emotionally? Having seen the skeletons in repose and present day at the beginning and not seeing their death, I think I found the ending in the movie sadly sweet, even if it is tragic, but would love to know what you think the effect is of how Reichert decides to reveal that moment. Oh, I, I found the ending to be kind of, it kind of took me by surprise, even knowing it was coming um, and just seeing the two men lying down to sleep next to each other. One of them is wounded. And um, I think, I mean, it is a, it is a, a framed story in the sense that you, we return to the beginning at the end. We, we, we don't return to the present day, but we see the living humans who would eventually become the skeletons that we saw at the beginning of the film. And it's just, um, yeah, I don't know. It's haunting. It's, it's really, it's, it's tragic in the sense that these two men who we've seen as good men, who we've rooted for, we've rooted for their friendship and their, their um, sort of mutual support for one another. And we know that they die at the end, even though we don't see them die because everyone dies and everything dies. And so it's not, you know, we know that the skeleton we've seen at the beginning is it's their skeletons because we connect the dots, but it's sort of, um, it's sad and surprising nonetheless that they have been, you know, the idea of them dying in this spot at this moment is, is a tragedy because it's, that's the way the story is told. I, I'm, I'm rambling. I don't know what I'm, yeah, no, I, I, emotionally, it, I, I don't know. There's something that she, her, her films always sort of hit me harder than I would think they would, um, and I think that's at least partly, or maybe, maybe even chiefly, because she's so um, skilled in sort of uh, depicting things without explicitly saying them. I think like her work with actors and. Um, uh, sort of suggesting things through gestures or, or, or actions um, outside of dialogue can have really profound, I mean, ha, ha, has had really profound effects on me in her films. Like, um, uh, ju uh, yeah, just thinking about like when I first saw Old Joy and you sort of have that moment where the, the, the two friends, which is like kind of, it's a similar ending as this film. It's about like sort of two friends just leaving each other and uh, it's not like a very uh, cinematic or like sort of movie moment. It's just two people saying goodbye in, in a very real way. And um, yeah, when the film sort of cuts, uh, when First Cow sort of cuts to the credits, when it, like sort of revealing like where their resting ground actually is in, in, in the, the, the film space, um, I don't know. You, I think back to the the beginning, the the William Blake quote, um, which is a sort of a way of like framing uh, the film on top of the present day framing, which is the his proverb, like sort of the the what is it the the bird a nest the the a spider the spider's web man friendship. I'm, I think I just butchered it, but <laughs> man, man has a home and a shelter in friendship. Is the gist right? Yeah, and I, I think like it, it's, you see the, like by the time you end the film, uh, you end it with their death and up till that point, you sort of see the film, or at least I saw the film as like a story of uh, friendship. And um, when I think back to the quote, um, having all of this in mind, you sort of think more deeply about the Blake proverb as, as friendship being both like something that enriches one's life, but also could lead to grave misfortune. Um, yeah, and even there's sort of the suggestion that, you know, the fact that they are laid to rest together effectively, that it's like, it's a bond like marriage. It's, a, it's like a sort of a covenant. You're, you're, um, if, you, if you and another person lean on each other like that, you are 
you know, you're both going to end up in the same place. You're both going to end up in the ground, but you're stronger if you make your way there together and, and um, sort of, it's, it's a solidarity. It's, it's an image of solidarity in a way. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, should we go to the next question from uh, Creighton Blinn? Uh, you mentioned hierarchies dissolving in first cow. I see there another parallel with Meek's cutoff. Uh, in the beginning of Meek's, the hierarchy of guide men settlers slash women settlers is very clear, yet uh, the further astray the wagon train goes, the more authority flows from the men to the women, especially Michelle Williams's character. Could you also see in both films a failure of humans to quote unquote tame their environment? Eventually in First Cow, Cookie and King Lou are literally subsumed by nature. Um, Yeah, I, uh, I I certainly think of First Cow as uh, just as a way of just seeing a series of uh, people failing to, or just sort of missing out on this opportunity to forge a better place for everyone, but instead uh, follows the familiar track, which entails uh, just pillaging nature and cultures and um, just repeating the same mistakes um, of history and which is like especially ironic when King Lou at one point says like history hasn't arrived yet but like to them it hasn't but like now in hindsight like uh, no <laughs> like, yeah that is history <laughs> the, ver the by virtue of the story being told by Kelly Reichardt their life is has become you know fictional piece yeah. of history um, yeah and it's certainly I mean I think there's a sense that the sort of fight to win the American West is adjudicated by nature and by the way that you know different men's different ways of navigating nature and establishing human structures within nature you know which one of those methods will win out um, and that's I think it comes back to makes cut off um, and arguably even you know you see some of this in certain women it's uh, you see you know old joy is a movie about relationships between humans within nature within a nature that is grand and majestic and indifferent and um, sort of impossible to really contain um, and I think I you know if if I think in some ways that has, is a, a thesis that she's continually revisiting is the idea of, you know, what does it even mean for men to have interpersonal relationships and, and power structures within nature, within, within you know, this, this world that's indifferent to us? Yeah. Um, yeah, and I think this, like, failure to tame one's environment, yeah, goes to, like, actual human, human nature or not nature, but, but rather, like... Uh, the sort of customs that we've constructed given whatever time period, like I'm like, I was just thinking of in, you brought up certain women, there's that part where Michelle Williams uh, is talking to um, the Rene Auberginois character who's also in First Cow and he's this guy in certain women who he has that like slate rock or some sort of rock, right? Yeah, and she's, granite or something. Something like that in front of his house and she and Michelle Williams is basically explicitly asking if she can buy it from him and he's he can barely like look at her because he's so uncomfortable with the idea of uh because michelle williams is with uh her husband and he's just so uh like paralyzed by michelle williams taking the lead in this transaction and not her husband yeah it's actually speaking of renee aubergenois um i i think his casting in both these films is actually maybe maybe telling, I mean, I might be, I might be projecting or reading too much into this, but there's sort of a, like a metatextual connection with um, McCabe and Mrs. Miller, which he's also in yeah. uh, as sort of a, as a small, in a small role as sort of a frontiersman um, in this frontier town. And that's also, you know, that's one of my favorite movies. And it's also one that's about sort of power struggles and power negotiations between the sexes and between man and 
you know, wilderness, man staking his claim on wilderness and, and asserting, you know, systems of capitalism and, and patriarchy. And um, just the fact that this one actor sort of ties these films together to me means something. And I would love to, uh, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm not sure if, if Kelly Reichardt has spoken about that in any interviews, but I would love to find out. Yeah, I don't know. Um, yeah, it's, yeah, he, he uh, sort of bears the weight of, of film history in, in that moment. Uh, and it's like, just, he's just very briefly in First Cow sweep it, sweeping. Yeah. <laughs> sort of part of the landscape in a way. Um, I see that we have an, one, another uh, comment from Soleil. Um, she says, do you feel there was a significant power dynamic between the two friends? And if so, do you feel it was driven by more of an ingrained sense of place and hierarchy or simply by character? Um, that's an interesting question because in some ways, I mean, we haven't really touched on what this movie is doing with race, um, but it's definitely there in the relationship between Cookie and King Lou. There's a there's a complicated power dynamic between the two of them because on the one hand, um, Cookie's a white man and in this setting presumably would be granted more social power. Um, but in terms of their interpersonal dynamic and their personalities, um, there's a sort of a greater sense of equity and of partnership and in which, you know, in some ways, King Lou feels like um, he exerts some kind of some kind of benign power in that friendship. And um, it's I don't know what to make of that. What other than it's sort of the idea that within a friendship, you know, friendship can can transcend and move beyond imposed power structures. Yeah. The, I, the King Lou character is really interesting to me, especially like his his sort of origins within the film. I, like it's like he has a very wild introduction where he's he's found like naked in in the woods, and his story is that he fled like um, a group of Russians because he killed some one of them because they had killed one of his friends, and I can't remember the reason he gave for uh, like shedding his clothes and and weapons. Do you remember? Either. No, I can't. I don't. But, does he? He may not give a reason. I can't remember if it's specific. Maybe not. But like, it, there's some. There's there is something like weirdly suspicious about that, and like you can't. I don't know. I, I couldn't quite tell if that was the truth or if we were meant to just believe that point blank um, as viewers, because like you then eventually see that he is this like really shrewd yeah. character and. Uh, and like a like a survivor in multiple different kinds of environments like the next time you see him he is suddenly like he's back wearing clothes and just drinking in a bar and he seems to be like a-okay um but he's really like he's also really attractive because he's he's really warm and uh um he's very like easy to listen to he, and he's like it, his his ambitions are kind of inspiring in the way he talks about them yeah. and it makes sense that someone like Cookie would be drawn to him because he's sort of a foil in in, in how shy and 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 humble he is and and yeah he is like he's a, he is a white man and but he's also like he was indentured and I think the implication is that he's Jewish too because his name is um, Figowitz yeah. Um, so in a sense, they're both outsiders. Yeah. Yeah. And there's, there's definitely the relationship between those two men, while there are these, there are power dynamics, but you have the sense that they consciously decide to reach across those, those dynamics and be, be partners, you know, King Lou sees Cookie as a partner, whereas Chief Factor sees him as an employee and, and, and you know, just a source of labor as opposed to a, a business partner. Oh, yeah. Um, 
yeah, you definitely like get a sense of the, the like the spirit of reciprocity between them as opposed to the relationship to the chief factor and in, in that like um, Cookie does him a favor at the start of the film by like hiding him and or like giving him food and stuff and a place to sleep. And then like once they meet each other again, King Lou exchanges um, uh, the like the favor and gives him a place to sleep as well. And um, yeah, I, I never, yeah, I never doubted that, that like the, um, how genuine that, that friendship was. It, d it did feel very real and also like how, um, how good uh, John Lagaro is and O'Reilly Lee uh, in their roles. Yeah, the performances are great across the board. I wish we could have gotten more of Lily Gladstone. I would have loved to see, get a, get a more of a look into her character's life. Um, yeah, her, yeah, I know we're kind of running out of time, but uh, her, her character was fascinating in, in such a brief moment of like what that, that story was, mm -hmm. this, this um, uh, indigenous American who marries Toby Jones's character and, um, and sort of exists between these two cultures now is, is really fascinating. You, you get a sense of it in that scene, but yeah, I was hungry for more of that. Um, well, we're just about in an hour and I think we're, uh, I don't think there are any more questions unless I'm missing, missing them, but. Yeah, it looks like no more comments. Yeah, I think in some ways this is a movie that I, um, I mean, you could talk about forever, but I also, I like to talk about and then kind of sit quietly with and, and um, alternate between those two modes of engaging with it. Yeah. Tune so. in next week, we'll be returning to <laughs> first cow. That's right. <laughs> Second installment. Um, but yeah. And, and if you if you didn't catch the the free talk with Kelly and Dennis, uh, that's up on our YouTube page. It's about an hour, um, so you can uh, check that out at your leader. Um, and it's they're you know, it's a great conversation. Um, and of course, if you want to see it again, it's still uh, available to rent in our virtual cinema. Um, but yeah, thanks to everyone who attended. Thank you for your questions. Um, as always, thank you, Maddie. Yeah, thanks, Tyler. Thank you all for coming.